Hello, everyone, and welcome to Alta Live. I'm so happy to see you all filling in here. Um, joining today's discussion on the Huntington Library and the unlikely friendships forged in its depths. My name is Jessica Blau. I'm Alta's associate editor, subbing in for uh, Beth Spotswood today. She'll be back so soon, but I'm excited to be here today with our lovely guest, Victoria. The author of three novels and two story collections, Victoria Patterson lives with her family in South Pasadena and teaches fiction in Antioch's Master's, Master of Fine Arts program. She's the author of Basement Buddies, which is a beautiful feature story in issue 27 of our magazine, which features LA storytellers. Uh, before we begin with our conversation, just some brief housekeeping. Alta Live is the digital interview series we do here at Alta Journal. If you're unfamiliar with Alta, we are an award-winning quarterly magazine and website focused on California and the West. You can join us as a member for as little as $3 a month and support the work that we do, including our monthly California Book Club, which is free and very fun to join, as well as presenting weekly events like this one today. If you haven't yet joined Alta as a member and you have been considering it, I really encourage you to join us. So thank you in advance if you're up for becoming a member today. Please use the Q&A button at the bottom of our screen to, of your screen to ask questions for our guests. I will chat with Victoria for about 30 minutes, and then we'll get to as many of your questions as we can. This will all be recorded and posted to altaonline.com later today. And we will send you an email with a link to the video, a link to Alta, and some invites to our upcoming events as well. With that, it is so good to be here today in community with all of you. Uh, let's see where everyone is and connect a little bit virtually. I am zooming in from San Francisco today. Victoria, where are you? <laughs> well, Jessica, I'm in the basement at Ian's desk, Ian's desk basement at the Huntington Library in San Marino. And thanks everyone for being here. Wonderful. Um, absolutely. This, I think this is so cool to have this all to live really from the basement, which, uh, which is what we're talking about today. Um, for our audience members who might be unfamiliar, can you tell us what the Huntington Library is? So the Huntington Library is is um, it's it's uh, just a tourist destination that's been here um, since I I wish Linnell was here. She would tell us the exact date and the timeline. I know she she's um, in the audience, but um, it was started, it was built by Henry Huntington, who was um, Arabella Huntington and Henry Huntington. It was her nephew. And she married him after um, she, her Huntington, Hen, uh, Collis Huntington passed away. She married her nephew. And she's really the reason this whole um, place was built. And, um, you know, it's, it's, um, she's, kind of amazing for 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 people who don't know about her and and I find it interesting that she's um main she's not really talked about here in the way that I, I feel like she should be um but anyway so this the the Huntington was built for her and she and to kind of impress her by her nephew and um and she only spent, I think, I think a couple months out of the year here, but it's, um, this was her home. This is originally, and they, 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 uh, um, bought a bunch of art and everything and, um, and built this place for her, but she preferred her, her, I think Paris and New York. And she is, I, I as I understand it, um, she's one of uh one of the characters on hbo's the gilded age is based on her the the one that's got the sketchy background and <laughs> and is um not uh yeah accepted among the other new york uh ladies or the vanderbilts and the whatever's the asters mm -hmm. so fascinating i have never heard about any of that history that's so fascinating i know i don't i always kind of want to throw that in there because i think it's 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 really fascinating. Mm -hmm. And so you do something very specific in the Huntington Library and kind of unique, something not everyone does. Can you explain that? So I'm a, I'm an author and um, basically I just, uh, I 
needed a place to work. And, um, and I had heard that you could get a readership here. And if you were researching, you know, something specific. And so I applied and in um, 2018 and, and was accepted um, and uh, kind of bounced around working in different locations and really enthralled by the, um, by the history here and the amount of books and research and, and the things that I could do. So I wasn't necessarily working as much as I should be. And then I found my way down into the basement finally, because it's very private. And when I write, I, a lot of times I mumble to myself. Um, and, you know, you can't do that when you're in public, it really causes <laughs> some problems. And so I craved some real privacy and real quiet. So I found myself in this basement and, um, and it was down that way a little bit where I ended up lodging myself and, and at first. And uh, that's how I started working down in the basement. And that's how I first initially met Ian because he would come down and walk past the, the hall past me. Mm. And so I knew someone else was down here as well. That's how I initially met him. And then I kind of spied and found his desk, um, which I'm sitting at now. And um, at that time, he had bookcases and shelves and lights and, and stacks of papers and and just which was, you know, really unusual. So, yeah, I was going to ask, is that typical? Is are there assigned seats at the Huntington or is it, you know, you just kind of stake your claim? Um, is it typical to have a bunch of things on your desk? So you're not allowed to bring um, pens or you're really about, you can bring in ma mainly your computer and your phone, but there's no, uh, and only pencils. And it's, pr it's very strict that way. And when you um, leave your, your bags are checked by security to make sure that, you know, everything stays where it's supposed to. And so it's very unusual to find someone um with that much personal items down I mean it's shockingly so yeah it yeah. was it was stunning shocking to me <laughs> and <sighs> you get into this in your story for Alta which is just so wonderful and so heartwarming mm -hmm. um but how did you go from kind of observing Ian's desk to an eventual friendship so he was also very we're both kind of um, I say, and I think in the article that the basement draws a certain kind of bird out of the underbrush. And so we're both not social beings, I would say. And so he would walk by and we would kind of just stare at each other. And then he eventually said, hello. And I said, hello. And then he said, nice to meet you. Nice to meet you. Um, nice to see you. And then on Tuesdays, they have uh, uh, tea and cookies for the academics and researchers and for everyone to gather and meet each other. And they, they do, they use, they do it somewhere else now, but they used to do it right upstairs. And, um, and I would, uh, I also befriended, I got in trouble because I was leaving personal books down here and stuff. So, um, a librarian contacted me and, um, and asked, and also I had a bunch of books that weren't checked out and I was supposed to be researching Mark Twain and I had a bunch of books on mystics and I was just all over the place. <laughs> and so he emailed me and I met with him and his name was Christopher Ade. He, he was an amazing librarian, head librarian. He was here for, I think he was here almost 30 years. And I went to go apologize. And he's the one that said, you know, um, I said, who's the guy that's down there with all this stuff at his on his desk, he said, that's Ian Whitcomb. And he said, you know, look him up. He's amazing. And, and then he told me, um, he, he basically encouraged me to be friends with him and said, he's really lonely and, um, and he's had a stroke and it would be really lovely if you guys struck up a friendship. And then during tea time, tea cookie time, where I usually took my tea and cookies and like went alone somewhere and didn't talk to anybody. He had me come sit with Ian and Ian and I, that's when we first had our first conversation. And, um, and then after that, we just 
would see each other and talk quite a bit down here. Well, and for our audience members um, for whom that name might not ring a bell, when you looked up Ian, what did you find? Well, first I found the his um, song. You really turned me. You turned me on. You really turned. He was a. He had a a big hit in the sixty. It, it, uh, the Brit invasion, and so I I listened to that song, and I just couldn't believe that was the same guy, you know. And it really, it's such a fun, lively. Uh, nutty song um it really tickled me and um and then I found out that he you know he was he's just I really admired that he um he followed his artistic inclinations and he was uh kind of a renaissance guy in terms of he wrote uh about musical history he did radio shows he um he did a documentary about the Huntington i I've seen that Christopher showed me, um, whereas he didn't just, he didn't want to, he, he, it wasn't in his heart to be kind of a heartthrobby rock star. So he was more of a versatile musician and lo lover of music and, and, um, ragtime and, and, um, and I learned, you know, that he, um, he was quite, quite amazing. Mm -hmm. Um, and then when, as you became friends, what kind of things did you talk about? What kind of things did you share with each other? Well, <laughs> um, what did we, we talked to, we, he, he complained a good deal. He was, he was, he was, um, you know, he was depressed. He had, he had lost the function of his 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 arm so he couldn't play his music and he was lonely and um and so we talked about that we talked um he came here he he would come here every day pretty much because um his his wife Regina encouraged him to get out of the house and and so he 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 was um he was a little bit lost when I when I met him and um, so we just kind of, we talked about life. We talked about our philosophies. He asked me a lot of questions about my writing. He wanted to know about my family. Um, and he gave me his, uh, his CDs. Um, he gave me some of his books and then I give him, I gave him my books and he, we, we read each other's work and we, we talked about that. Um, he was very um, encouraging of my work um, and curious about writing mm -hmm. um, and about the kind of writing that I do. So we talked about that a lot. And we talked about authors. We talked about books. Um, he was he really loved short stories. So he would talk about um, the different short stories that he was reading. And and um, what else did we? Yeah, we talked about everything. Mm -hmm a lot we talked about a lot is there a greater sense of literary community in the library like are friendships like this kind of rare or this is kind of rare yeah <laughs> I have friends who um that are writers who work here and 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 they work in the normal spot where you're supposed to work and so I do see them or I you know but this was this was our own little world down here I would say me and Ian and um, we had kind of a little special little thing going. And so, um, but yeah, but there are writers that, that I am friends with that, you know, we'll meet for tea or have lunch or go, go for a walk or this or that, but nothing like what I had with, with Ian. It was a different kind of thing. Mm, yeah. Absolutely. In fact, I they would say they thought I was a little bit, I think they think maybe I'm a little bit odd probably <laughs> Ian, Ian. <laughs> well the best writers often are right? yeah I guess. <laughs> um yeah did um did you are there other is it common to find a though a niche celebrity a celebrity of some kind in the Huntington library oh that's um probably let's see 
Yeah, I didn't really even think of him that way. That's so, you know, which is kind of funny. I think because he, um, he didn't really think of himself that way, honestly, or he didn't seem to. And he was pretty, as I said, he was, he was, um, he lived, he lived for his music. He really, um, he felt very much like he didn't have that to live for anymore. So it's funny that I, I didn't never thought of him as a celebrity. Um, but yeah, I'm sure there's, there's other, others run wandering around. <laughs> none, none in the basement though. I don't think, I think oh, Ian was one of, he, he, yeah. And he, he'd been at this desk that I'm working at now. He'd been here for like 25 years. This was his desk before I, before I took it over after he passed away. Mm. Yeah, could you tell us a little bit about the space that you're in and the basement and how many people are down there and why it was so special to encounter someone else down there? Right. Well, nobody really comes down here. So that's that's why it was so there are desks down here, but um it's it's um because it is it's cold down here. It's colder than normal. It's cold up there too, but it's very it's I think it's a, a, about maybe colder down here. And also, um, it's just kind of creepy. There's, if the lights are off, it looks scary. And I would walk around and show you, but I don't think they would appreciate that. So I'm not gonna, <laughs> but it's, um, so it's not a popular place to go unless you're looking for a book. Um, and pre-pandemic, I know there, there there's, it's really labyrinthine down here. There were sections of the library I mean it is so fascinating there's like tunnels and I'm I I would just go wandering around just um looking at everything and I did see before the pandemic and they shut off some of the sections that there was another burst person who had burrowed down here who um they had put kind of a someone had put um probably Christopher a little photo of his um computer and from the eighties, you know, and he had since passed off, passed away. So someone else that those were the only three, me, Ian, and this guy that had passed away, as far as I know, um, are the only ones that have kind of claimed a space down here besides David Kippen, who comes down every once in a while now, Yeah, <laughs> but he's not down here as much as me. Yeah. Well, let's talk a little bit about, let's go back a little bit to your friendship with Ian and then. Okay. Can you tell us a little bit about how that friendship concluded? Well, the um, as I said, we were we were both down here pretty much every day, and we we'd have converse and quite a bit. And I knew, uh, you know, that he was ailing, and um, and then the pandemic hit, and we lost our um, privileges. For and during that time, I stayed in touch with Christopher, the librarian who because we were concerned about Ian who um, did go into a hospital and he got, he became sick and then, um, and then he passed away during the pandemic. So um, after I think it was about 15 months, they opened the Huntington again for the readers. And, um, and I rushed down, you know, to Ian's desk and all his stuff was gone. And, um, and then that was when I kind of eventually planted myself here mm. and is it's sort of in his honor mm-hmm. so he's here yeah <laughs> he's good yeah, right in your I mean he was here he was yeah. in this space for 25 more years and so when I'm down here I I definitely it has his it has his his mojo mm-hmm. um in a in a, in all sorts of ways mm-hmm. so I feel him here you you have a little story <laughs> in your um in your piece for Alta about a little turf war of sorts between you uh, and Kiffin. Do you want to share that? Yeah, so they're they're not the desk because nobody really use them. They're not assigned down here. They're not really assigned anywhere. And um, but I really claimed this one as because my heart was feeling Ian's loss, and um, so I I took it over and. Um, and nobody really comes down here, but I came down one day and, um, and David Kippen was sitting here and, um, and I, 
when someone sits here, I kind of, it startles me. And so I kind of, I think I glared at him or maybe, you know, he definitely, I was giving out hostile vibes. And then I went to another desk and then um, one day we were down here and, and Christopher, the librarian happened to be down here and he, David and I had a conversation um, where uh, Christopher talked about my friendship with Ian and, and David understood that, um, oh, I better not say that. <laughs> that's, that's what's going on. And so the next time I came down and Dave, you know, and um, David was already here, he was sitting at the, another desk and he's never sat at this desk again. <laughs> <laughs> and he seems to, you know, kind of under, he does, he just knows that's, that's Tori's desk. She did, she's Ian's friend and Ian wants her to sit there and she wants to sit there and I'm not going to mess with that. Whatever's going on, <laughs> I think I'll just sit over at that other desk. And now he sits at that other desk. And you said you've been working in the library for a little since 2018 and Ian had been there for 25 years mm -hmm. wow. he loved it here he loved the Huntington and um I mean he he just loved it here mm -hmm. he actually did do a little documentary about it and some he loved California he loved Southern California he lived in Altadena mm -hmm. and um and I think he had that um ex you know from a different place coming here and just this appreciation about Southern California that only a, a Brit who could have sort of wide eyed, like this is, this is great. So he really, really loved it. The Huntington. When did you know that you were going to write about your relationship with Ian? That's Linnell is uh, who I know is here. She and I um, both work here. And she's done a lot of research here. So I was actually in the cafeteria or the 1919 cafe on cookie and tea day, but it, w it was after that. It was a Tuesday, I remember. And um, we were waiting for some food or something. And I started telling her about Ian and that he'd passed away and about our friendship. And she said, why haven't you written about that? You need to write about that. And so I thought, oh, do I? I guess I do need to write about that. So it really was Linnell and she um, helped me um, the whole way through. And then she introduced me to Mary Melton, who was the editor on this piece, who was just so amazing and really helped, helpful. And, and they both guided the piece along and, and encouraged me. And, mm -hmm. and so I was able to write about it. Mary is our editor at large at Alta Journal. She's wonderful to work with. Um, and we, after this event, we will send an email with the link to read your piece and other pieces in that LA Storytellers section, including one by Linnell as well. Um, yeah. So how, Victoria, how do you reflect on your friendship with Ian now? Um, yeah, it's, it's still kind of a profound friendship. I feel like, um, I'm, I've reached that time age or something about who I am, my life, where uh, a lot of the people that I dearly love have moved on and, and um, but they're still with me. And I feel that way with Ian and um, he, he was, as I say, sad. And when I met him and so when I come down here too, it's kind of, I, it makes me really want to work to to not waste any time and to do what I love and to appreciate um what I do and um because I feel like a lot of the time with him and that I was encouraging him to keep working or to to maybe dictate into a recorder like you can still write you can still do stuff and and he was really he really didn't think he had anything left you know and um, so for me, um, I think a, a part of it is a warning, like don't, you got, don't squander anything, really do what you love and um, 
and appreciate every second that you can Mm -hmm. that I get to do what I love and that I get to work and and get to be here absolutely um I am gonna jump in with some audience questions now uh they've been trickling through please use the Q&A button at the bottom of the screen if you want to add yours um Marta asks can you have a photo of Ian on or near the desk? And I believe the answer to that oh, is probably not. They did after he passed away, uh, Christopher Ade, the librarian, did put a picture of him up here and it said, you know, welcome, my friend. I'm glad you're using my desk. And um, they kind of cracked down a little bit and and that disappeared. Um so they they don't want they they it's it's a little strict more strict so i think if if i put a picture of ian up it might disappear (laughs) yeah maybe i I could hide or tuck it somewhere i don't know yeah that's a great idea he's he's here he's here yeah absolutely um dina was wondering if you could tell more about the secrets from the archives, or are there any, you know, exciting discoveries you've made from doing your research at the Huntington that you could share? The archives are insane. I mean, the, the amount of history and the amount of research that you can do here. And I, I the only thing I did, I, my, my thing as a writer, I think that's why Christopher Ade, my, I was so eclectic about what I was reading and what I was looking at. He was like, what is she doing? You know, this is <laughs> nuts. And, um, the the one thing I did go down the rabbit hole a little bit was I looked I was fascinated by the the Macy's that used to be in Bullocks because my great grandma had worked there in the Chinaware department so I pulled up a, a lot of old photos of that that um as the when it was the Bullocks and I got the magnifying glass and I was looking at all the employee spaces and trying to find my great grandma which I never did find her face but I. I did a lot of um, sort of personal research like that. And, um, you know, I because tr- you really could just do that instead of work, you know. And so, um, for instance, I love books. So I could go and look at a first edition of a book that I, you know, and I just, I just, I have to be careful not to get to in that research rapture because, um but down here, there, I, like I said, there they used to have it opened up, and I would go and explore. And I, I they had those kind of things where you would crank, and the bookshelves yeah. would open up. And I was just like, I am gonna, I just cannot. This is too exciting. It's like Disneyland for nerds, you know. And um, and I remember having a conversation with Christopher one time because I was thinking all these books and they're just sitting here and nobody's reading them all these obscure poets and this and that and and so I mean part of it is like you can just touch one and open it up and and crack it open and let it come to life a little bit and put it back and I just feel like the um maybe I'm not doing disciplined research or something but I feel like the it's I sound very woo woo a little bit, but no, I do feel like all. it all comes. It's <laughs> all like it's the it's what's going on down here that um, as well that that I'm amongst all that mystery, all that all those words, all those hidden words, and yeah, shelves that open up, and magazines and old magazines, and just so much down here. Well, it's a little bit kid in the candy store a little bit like happy place yeah absolutely what a wonderful place to be yeah Um, no I'm very lucky yeah uh so one one viewer noticed that you wear a key around your neck in your are you does that have any relevance to your story or your research it doesn't it it, it's a graphic artist named Julia Wirtz and I love her work and she I got it on her Etsy she she um does what she calls i think it's called urban or where where they they go into an abandoned building and explore and she found this is kind of sad but she did she found a bunch of keys at a in an abandoned insane asylum mm. and this was one of the keys and and so um 
but she's she's great. She has she has um, a bunch of graphic novels, and she's an amazing artist as well. I think she lives in LA now. So very cool. Yeah, thank you, thank you for the the shout out to Julia. We'll check that out. Um, Ed asks from your talks with Ian, what era of his life or his study um, did you find he was most proud of? He really loved his liner notes for Titanic. And he was really proud of that CD. And um, he, he, he was a, he really wanted to be a writer. I feel like he, he really, or he really loved writing and writers and, um, and reading. Mm -hmm. um, but I would say the, the liner notes for the Titanic and that CD as well. He was really proud of that. Um, and he was just really humble too, in his own way. I have to say he 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 never bragged about anything or made himself um yeah but he he loved he loved all the ragtime and the, all the the different ty styles of music he wasn't um and he also was really proud of having worked with Mae West mm. which um and produced her and 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 spoke spoke highly of her absolutely Linnell asks, and I'm curious too, did you begin listening to his music or do you still listen to his music? I do. I I, I did. I listened to the, I, the Titanic CD. I remember listening to that over and over again when he gave it to me and his CDs. And I still very much, I listen to his music quite a bit. Question from uh, Kelly. Do you feel like the space, the library, and I guess particularly this desk, does it feel like it belongs to you or belongs to the other regulars? Um, did you have like a little bit of imposter syndrome when you started? Um, and do you feel like a sense of like home or ownership over it now? That's a good question. Um, I don't have imposter syndrome mainly because I am just such a, um, a writer. Mm -hmm. You know, I know that what that's what I am. And, um, and I do feel like this is my, this is my and Ian's desk. It's mm -hmm. Ian's desk. So when I come down, I bring my journal usually. And, and I, I journal almost every day and I write the date. And then the first thing I write to, is where I am. And so I always, that's why I just always say Ian's desk, comma, basement. Mm -hmm. I don't say my desk, but just to, to, to locate where I am. It's Ian's desk. Yeah. And I'm here now. Oh, this is so, this conversation has been so amazing. Um, we have audience members wondering if they're unfamiliar with your work and they want to know more about your work. What's the best place to start with that? Um, I, I'm a liter uh, fiction writer mainly. I have um, two story collections and three novels um, and I write literary fiction. I also write nonfiction, but you can certainly Google my name and it, it, it will come up. and. Um, and I would describe it maybe as dark literary fiction. I think with a, a humorous angle, but others would say no. <laughs> <laughs> and I should say, we will send everyone links to Victoria's books as well and where to start exploring that. Um, we still have questions coming in, but I am going to start to wrap us up here um, because it is a little past one o'clock. But thank you so much, Victoria. I think people are just so curious about the library and about this story. Um, and please read it. Again, I'll send you a link. It's really heartwarming and very, um, very honest too. very much grounded in reality and grounded in this wonderful experience you've had. Um, Thank you again to Victoria and thank you to everyone for tuning in. If you were late to this conversation or if you want to watch it again, we'll have the entire recorded interview up on altaonline.com later today. And we are, we are taking a break next week to observe the Juneteenth holiday, but we will be back for Alta Live on June 26th in two weeks. Thank you again, Victoria, and thank you to all of you who attended. Um, have a great rest of your week and stay safe. Thank you, Jessica. Thank you, everyone, for coming.